Um, good morning, everyone. Welcome to our first panel. Um, we will be talking about meat and dairy markets. My name is Marsha Brown. I'm a reporter for the Capital Forum, which is an investigative news outlet focused on markets and competition policy. Um, and I'll be introducing our presenters for the, this panel. Um, and then they will each um, go into their paper and talk about their research. Um, and then at the end of their presentations, we'll open it up. I will ask a few questions and then we'll have audience questions, both for those who are in person and also those who are um, joining us online. Um, so I'm just gonna go down the line here. Um, Pete Hardin, he is the editor of The Milkweed, a monthly dairy economics report he founded in 1979. He'll be presenting a paper called The Northeast Dairy Dilemma, Solutions for Concentration in a Vertically Integrated Market. Uh, major subjects he's reported include dairy cooperatives, financial misdeeds, antitrust issues, food mislabeling, and exposing the dangers of Monsanto's recombinant bovine growth hormone. For over 20 years, Hardin has warned about concentration in New England's fluid milk industry, and that's his topic today. Um, and our, next, our next speaker will be uh, Nathan Miller, and Nathan is, excuse me, um, an associate professor at Georgetown University McDonough School of Business and editor at the Journal of Law and Economics. His research covers topics in the fields of industrial organization and antitrust economics with a recent focus on collusion and the competitive effects of mergers. Previously, he was an economist at the US Department of Justice where he provided econo economic analysis for antitrust investigations. Um, and his paper will be buyer power in the beef packer um, industry. Um, and then our third paper will be presented by Sachin Holdheim and Zakir Tamiz. Sachin is a first year student at Yale Law School focused on antitrust policy, competition policy, and consumer protection. Prior to law school, Sachin worked at the economic consulting firm Cornerstone Research, where he used economic and statistical analysis to support expert witness testimony for litigation in antitrust and finance cases. Zakir Tamiz is a first year student at Yale Law with an interest in antitrust law, consumer protection, and plaintiff side litigation. Previously, he earned a master's degree in law and economics as a Fulbright scholar at Queen Mary University in London, where he studied European Union law and published law review articles on anti competitive agreements in the pharma industry. They will be presenting a paper called Agristat's Trouble in the Safety Zone Information Sharing in the Meat Processing Industry. So, um, Sachin and, and um, Zach Beauty, do you want to go? You want to start? Take it away. Awesome. Um, can you guys hear me? Uh, thank you so much for the uh, great introduction. And uh, I'm Sachin. And I'm Zach here. And we're super excited to kick off this conference. Um, OK. Uh, so we're going to be talking about Agristats, um, which is a notorious uh, private data exchange facilitator in the meat processing industry. Um, we're also going to be talking about how they've taken advantage of a loophole in DOJ and FTC safety zone guidelines and how this is promoting anti-competitive behavior across the industry. So um, we actually got a great uh, a primer on the history from our, from our first speaker, so I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but just to hammer some quick points home, the meat processing market is at its most consolidated um, throughout history. Uh, the structure of the market has gone through some dramatic changes. It's now characterized by few very large plants um, with supply chains that are tightly controlled by meat processing companies. So this is the heart of our paper where we're focusing. Um, meat processing companies are, are those that buy <coughs> meat from, from ranchers and from meat suppliers and then sell it um, to retail markets. Um, the supply chain as it stands is really vulnerable to disruption, um, as we've seen uh, with plant closures during COVID spiking meat prices and reducing meat supply um, earlier this year and last year. All right, so we're going to now turn to Agristats Inc. Um, it's the most po uh, powerful private data reporting service that you've never heard of, and you also wouldn't be able to tell from its uh, lackluster website, but it's been sued over 100 times for facilitating anti-competitive behavior in the meat processing market. Um, and it serves a key role in the national meat processing cartel, um, as alleged by the White House and in litigation all across the country. So Agristats operates in the broiler chicken, hog, turkey, and egg industries, where it contracts with meat processing companies to exchange private and proprietary data at the plant level using benchmarking reports. Um, these reports uh, share a significant amount of proprietary and private data. 
Um, and it's used by almost everyone in the industries in which it operates. 95% of all poultry producers contract with Agristats and 80% of all turkey producers. Um, this, this information is just not the kind that would be shared between rivalrous companies. Um, in litigation in Illinois, it came out that um, information shared includes where broiler producers buy their breeder stock and feed, the size of production facilities, production capacity, including the numbers of eggs, the size of breeder flocks and other inventory numbers, as well as private financial information about each company. Importantly, Agristats shares historical data that is directly tied to future production. So they might share the number of eggs three months ago, which leads to the number of chickens almost directly um, that might be on the market now. Um, Agristats nominally anonymizes its data, um, but it does so using a very flawed methodology. Um, it assigns each plant a number based on the time at which the plant registered with Agristats. That number never changes, and it's entirely possible to match public using public data um, plants to, to uh, the firms in which they operate. Um, this is something that uh, also Agristats has a history of accidentally leaking um, these anonymization keys um, to firms across the industry. Um, meat processing CEOs across the board understand the importance of Agristats to their business. They routinely cite it in calls with business analysts and investors. And Agristats, um, through this regime of highly detailed information exchange, serves as a cartel enforcer um, by ensuring that all of the rivals are kept abreast at all times of current and future production levels. Um, but is this behavior legal? Agristats has been sued in private enforcement, but none of the DO, uh, but the DOJ and the FTC have not led a, an enforcement action against Agristats. This might be because of these information exchange guidelines um, released by both agencies. Um, these guidelines govern the information exchanges between rivals, and they create notably a safety zone within which agencies will presume legality as long as three conjunctive conditions are met. The first is what we call the third party exception, um, where the exchange is managed by a third party, like a trade organization. The second is when um, we call it the historical data exception. It's when all data uh, exchanged is historical. And the third is the anonymization exception. So at least five participants must provide, um, uh, must contribute to the underlying statistics shared, and it should be impossible to determine the underlying um, identity of the data provider. Agristats really seems to be tailor-made to fit directly into these guidelines. So it is clearly a third party. Um, as talked about already, it deals only in historical data, although this can be uh, tied directly to future production. Um, and um, it nominally anonymizes its data. Um, importantly, Agristats was actually founded after um, its CEO spoke with an antitrust lawyer who said, as long as you talk about history, you're okay. Um, but historical data is used by meat processing companies um, to use uh, to support their anti-competitive behavior. Um, so like I said, Agristats appears tailor-made to fulfill these guidelines. And as such, um, no enforcement action has been brought against the company, despite many private actions. Um, but maybe one question is, where do these guidelines come from and how can they be reformed? So I'm now going to pass it over to Zachar. He's going to talk a little bit about the history of the safety tool. Sure. So Sachin really focused on Agristats and the meat processing industry. I'm going to focus on the safety zone guidelines and the DOJ and FTC's role in it. The, so the safety zone was first drafted by the agencies in 1996, specifically in the healthcare context. It was advice given to healthcare providers about what kind of information they could exchange. And then it, was, it wasn't until 20 years later, in 2014, when the agencies reapplied the same criteria, word for word verbatim, to the rest of the economy. And this is odd for a number of reasons. Healthcare is a, 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 an industry where you need to exchange a lot of information between different healthcare providers, between uh, different doctors and patients and stuff like that. Um, and it's also an industry that has a lot of health, antitrust scrutiny and, and monitoring, at least in the 1990s. And so it seems a bit strange to reapply the same guideline for healthcare in every other industry. Now, this might have been okay if the agencies explained why, or if they went into a lot of detail about the reasoning behind this, but they didn't. In fact, the, the safety zone guidelines aren't really guidelines either. Um, if you go on the DOJ or FTC's website and you look at formal guidelines, they have dozens and dozens of documents, safety zone isn't there. So where do you find the safety zone? You find it on an FTC blog post, a literal <laughs> blog post from 2014. And this blog post basically tells market participants that as long as you fit the criteria that such as mentioned, you're good, you're fine. Um, now, is this blog post really all that important? Well, the agencies cite their blog posts all the time. So there's a number of consent decrees where the agencies are doing enforcement actions and they'll quote verbatim from the blog post. Um, <laughs> There is, you know, there's guidelines, that, formal guidelines that the agencies issue where they cite the blog posts. 
and a lot of law firms and antitrust councils will write um, will write up you know advice to their clients and trade associations and the like where they will cite this blog post. Um, so now it's been 25 years since uh, the agencies have written these safety zone guidelines. Um, we think it's time to change them. The good news, the upside here is that if you write a blog post, you can change it by writing a new blog post. Um, so it's not like say the horizontal merger guidelines where it has to go through a lengthy process of change. Just we really propose that the FTC just write a new blog post um, with uh, three different um, changes. So what are proposals for reform? Number one, we think that the, that the agencies should remove how are we doing? Let's take a look at this. Okay, uh, I'll keep going then. So number one, we think the agency should remove the third party exception. In a service provider like Agristats can have enough incentive to, to kind of facilitate this conspiracy even though they're third parties. Um, they're kind of like a hub in a hub and spoke conspiracy except they're not actually a cartel member. Um, but this, is, this happens in a lot of other jurisdictions and uh, some scholars refer to this as a cartel secretary that kind of like mediates and sort of does the documentation and stuff like that for, um, for the cartel. And other jurisdictions like the EU and the Brazil have prosecuted and even criminally prosecuted consulting groups, data service providers, et cetera, for facilitating cartels. It's only in the United States where the antitrust agencies kind of exempt third parties. So we think that should be removed. Secondly, we think the historical data exception needs to be changed and shifted to a competitively sensitive data standard. Um, the agencies came up with this themselves in 2000, where they basically talked about how you know, companies shouldn't be exchanging data related to prices or input costs or output levels and product mixes. Um, and so we think that the agency should return to the standard and not, and not wholesale exempt historical data that includes competitively sensitive information. Lastly, we think this should clarify the anonymization exception. Um, so right now, Agrisats and other data service providers, they, what they do is they're not really anonymizing the data, they're pseudonymizing it. Pseudonymization is when you sort of uh, de-identify data in a way that's easy to re-identify. Um, there are actual techniques though that you can use to really anonymize data and other regulators like the European Union have issued guidelines to um, in the privacy context of how to properly anonymize data so that it cannot be reasonably re-identified. Uh, some of these techniques include like noise addition and permutation where they basically fuzz up the numbers, change certain things up, move things around in such ways that, that fundamentally alters the data. Uh, um, and so we think that if, if, you, if the company wants to be part of the safety zone, then they have to truly anonymize the data and the regulators can probably put out guidelines on how to do so. So why reform the safety zone? Um, as we talked about, the current safety zone guidelines really weren't meant for the whole economy and um, it's time to change them. Uh, they've clearly failed to prevent anti-competitive behavior in the meat industry as evidenced by agrostats. And we think there's gonna be two major effects here. First, it's gonna reform, um, it's gonna make it easier for government to enforce against uh, agrostats and other data service providers. It'll be much easier to pursue a case if you don't have a blog post that says that what they're doing is okay. Um, and secondly, we think it'll alter private behavior. So to mention how a lot of um, antitrust councils like um, Agrostats' council said, if you do historical data, you're fine. A lot of the guidance that um, councils give to businesses, that shapes the kind of behavior they do. So if we can change the guidelines, then we might change the messaging and, and what businesses actually do in practice. Right now, the message that the agencies send is sort of, you're good, be reasonable and you'll be fine. And instead, the messaging that we think the agency should send is if you're thinking about exchanging competitively sensitive information to raise prices, don't risk it with a brisket. Thank you. <laughs> Happy to be here today. Uh, thank you to Austin and, and uh, to David for putting together such a nice conference. Thank you to Fiona for all the energy she puts into the Thurman Arnold project. Uh, my name is Nathan Miller. Uh, I'd like to talk today some about the economics uh, in the beef supply chain as I see them. Uh, this represents um, opinions that have been formed in the, uh, in the process of doing research with a number of co-authors, including Francisco Garrido at ETOM, uh, Minji Kim, who's a graduate student at Georgetown, and Matt Weinberg, who's, a, who's at Ohio State University. Uh, I'm gonna focus specifically on the beef packers uh, that purchase cattle from uh, feedlots in the United States and process the cattle and sell them downstream to retailers uh, in the form of boxed beef. Uh, there's four main beef packers in the United States. And as an empirical fact, if we look over, say the last seven or eight years, starting in about 2015, a wedge has opened up between the price that the packers pay for cattle and the price they obtain from retailers for boxed beef, okay? 
um, uh, that increases are substantial. Uh, this spread between the prices has roughly doubled or tripled uh, during this time period. Uh, there is no basis to think that it is due to changing costs um, or changing demand. In fact, the, the biggest change in the price has been uh, lower prices that have been paid to, to feed lots and that then flow through and have implications for ranchers and stockers um, uh, in the economy. So um, I will propose uh, uh, two possible explanations for the increase in what I'll call the packer spread. Uh, the first is one I will not focus much on in this talk, which is collusion among the Packers. Um, this is always a possibility. The Department of Justice, as I understand it, has been investigating collusion for 18 months. I do not see a lawsuit, and so I'm going to focus instead on a, a contracting device. Uh, and I'm going to teach about the economics of contracts in this talk um, and why something that's a detail in the transactions between feedlots and Packers can have potentially important consequences for, for realized market outcomes. I'm going to start with a graph, and it's going to show you how uh, transactions are sold or uh, occur between feedlots and, and packers. I'll give you the graph if the clicker works. There we go. Had to point it in the right direction. The solid line here, the solid black line labeled cash market uh, shows you the proportion of cattle that are transacted on something that I'll loosely call the cash market. It's just negotiations that happen every week between feedlots and packers. Um, historically speaking, this has accounted for the bulk of sales. In 2005, it's still about 60%. Uh, in, at the end of 2019, which is the last year for which uh, I'll be using data, the cash market now constitutes barely 20% sales all right so how you know how do cattle get sold to feedlots predominantly now they use something called formula contracts a formula contract is an informal agreement between a feedlot and a packer under which a feedlot commits to supplying cattle in the future and the price that the feedlot obtains is determined by the price on the cash market at the date that the cattle changes hands Okay. Also on the graph, I show you a, a forward contract, which accounts for a smaller fraction of sales. Uh, the economics for a, for a forward contract are going to be similar in some ways to those of a formula contract, and so I won't move. I won't discuss those much. But collectively, these are about eighty percent of the transactions. So let me talk about the economics of of these contract of these contracts first. Uh, when we when we have the contracts, we depress the incentives of the big four packers to bid aggressively in the cash market. And the reason is that if a packer bids aggressively in the cash market, not only does it lower, uh, uh, increase the price it must pay for cattle, it increases the price it's, it's got to pay for all of the formula contracts uh, that's already assigned uh, in this market. And that's a big effect, economically speaking, if 80% of the transactions are coming through these contracts. Second, this distortion is going to be economically, economically significant if individually each of the big four packers are large relative to the market. Okay, the reason is that the, 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 um, the incentive to distort cash market prices to affect what you pay on your contracts depends on your ability to move the cash market price. If packers are big, they can move the cash market price and affect what they pay on contracts. Therefore, it's the interaction of the size of the packers with these formula contracts that creates distortions in the market. Uh, third, each feedlot has an incentive to use an, alt, an MA or a contract, even though the contracts collectively lower the price of fed cattle. Okay, first of all, notice that the feedlot is getting the same price, whether it goes to the cash market or whether it uses a contract. And then it's true that the contract uh, will reduce risk because you provide something that might be called an assurance of a buyer. The feedlot will have a buyer for its cattle when the cattle become available, uh, uh, when the cattle are ready to be sold. Fourth, this main benefit that's provided by the contracts, the assurance of a buyer, exists only because the, con the contracts actually make the cash market thin. If you have a thick, robust cash market, the assurance of a buyer is just not an important consideration. And so in some sense, the existence of the contracts is creating the only 
substantial benefit that I can ascertain that the feedlots get from the contracts. Now there's empirical evidence that supports this notion that these contracts could be meaningfully affecting prices that are obtained. If you look between 2005 and 2019, uh, we can create statistical evidence that shows that weeks in which there's a 1% greater share of formula contracts on average have cash market prices that are 5% lower, which is consistent with the reduced bidding incentives that I've, that I outlined for you. All right. We also know that over 2005 to 2019, the, the big four have decreased their production capacity and they've lost some market share measured by volume. All right. But at the same time, the small packers have increased their capacities and volumes, which is consistent with what you might think about being greater market power of the big four. Um, and, and, you know, for, for this actual second fact, you could, you could explain it with both collusion or AMAs. So let me, let me just turn to some policy conclusions and, and I'll wrap up. Um, and, 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 and understand that these just flow immediately from the economics of the situation. And these policy conclusions are, are uh, uh, um, given in the spirit of the economics uh, more than the, the uh, regulatory obstacles to, 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 to change. There are two ways to reduce the economic effects of contracts, all right? The first is to ban them, all right? We could remove contracts for fed cattle in which prices are determined by subsequent cash market outcomes. Or you could divest plants of the big four so that no packers large relative to the market and the distortions introduced by the contracts have no significant ramifications. Okay, so let me, let me end there. Uh, again, appreciate the opportunity to speak and, and uh, thank you all for coming. A privilege to be here today. My compliments to the Yale Law School for, for hosting this event. Compliments to Austin for all the work he has put in, Austin and others. I want to say a special thank you to Zach Shelley, a second year law student here at Yale, who has assisted me with research formatting uh, of, the, of this paper, having written for, for farmers for 50 years, uh, preparing a paper for a prestigious law journal is a bit of a, is a bit of a cultural shock to me. So, so thank you, Zach. Um, Long overdue public concerns focus on concentration in agriculture and food with current emphasis on beef processors. As we know, four firms control roughly 85% of the beef kill capacity in this nation. Over the past decade, beef processors market power has yielded low prices paid for market weight cattle to producers and ever spiking retail costs for consumers. However, another staple, milk, faces a far greater degree of processor concentration. I estimate that one firm, Dairy Farmers of America, or DFA, controls at least 85% of conventional fluid milk processing in major parts of the Northeast. One firm, 85%. That geographic area includes all six New England states, New Jersey, New York City, Long Island, and the counties lining either side of the Hudson River Valley up to Albany. Within this geographic region, according to 2019 uh, population data, 38 million consumers live. By conventional milk, I refer to fluid milk that's pasteurized and processed for distribution to wholesalers, supermarkets, schools, and institutions. I eliminate niche categories and brands such as organic, kosher, lactate, Fairlife, A2, and ultra high temperature milk, which has a, a, a distribution range of up to a thousand miles, the latter does. Now, 22 years ago, in February 2000, Jonathan Healy, Massachusetts Commissioner of Agriculture, warned that a joint venture controlled 80% of fluid milk processing capacity in Massachusetts. In the late 19, 1990s and early 2000s, 
that firm, GTL, had swept up the following regional fluid milk companies, including Cumberland Farms, Gorelick Farms, Westland Creamery, New England Dairies, Nature's Bounty, Grant's Dairy, Stop and Shops Dairy Plant in Reedville, Massachusetts, and Fairdale Farms. Subsequent to that uh, uh, consolidation 20 to 22 years ago, DFA has acquired the additional following fluid milk companies. Guida Dairy in Connecticut, which processes roughly 97% of all milk processed in this state. Oakhurst Dairy in Maine, and ultimately through bankruptcy, Dean Foods, the nation's largest uh, fluid processor, but also New England's fluid, predominant fluid processor. In summary, going back, say, 22 years, every single major fluid milk processor in New England has been swept up by DFA, with the exception of HP Hood. Hood and DFA have their own special relationships that dates back many dates back roughly two decades. Now, dairy processing in and distribution is so non competitive in New England that the Boston School District has not received a competitive bids for the bulk of its school milk contracts since about 2014. Boston schools have awarded virtually exclusive school milk contracts to what's now DFA's Gorelick Farms since about 2014. Moving west from New England, DFA is now the sole, pro sole major processor of fluid milk in New Jersey, my home state. Tuscan dairies and farmland dairies, once the two bedrock fluid milk processors in North Jersey are long gone. No milk plants, no fluid milk plants exist in New York City, none on Long Island. In almost all instances, now turning to back to the farm, in almost all instances where DFA or its partners in crime acquired fluid, pardon me, acquired fluid milk plants, the dairy farmers, independent dairy farmers and cooperative shipping to those fluid milk plants had their milk markets and marketing of their milk taken over by either DFA or a subsidiary, Dairy Marketing Services, DMS. Combined, DFA and DMS have been the defendants in numerous class action antitrust cases brought by dairy farmers these these two firms always settled while never acknowledging wrongdoing again here in the northeast one firm 85 percent market share of conventional fluid milk in new england new jersey new york city long island and the hudson valley 38 million consumers what are proposed solutions number one form a regional dairy antitrust task force I would recommend that the attorneys general from New England, New Jersey, and New York State form a special permanent dairy antitrust task force to probe the potential economic harm to farmers and consumers resulting from DFA's market share in the Northeast. Two, study historic farm to retail margins. At each point in the farm to retail supply chain, what are the margins? This exact research was conducted years ago by Yukon uh, economist emeritus, Dr. Ronald Cotterell, who's here today. In 2003, a few years after the, the New England dairy processors consolidation, Cotterell's research data in testimony before uh, the Judiciary Committee of the United States Senate demonstrated shrinking prices paid to dairy farmers and higher prices for milk at the store paid by consumers. Uh, what would update, updated data show? Solution number three, investigate historic school milk contracts bidding. Decades ago, milk processors bid rigging of annual school milk contracts was a widespread 
scheme and controversy. Today, so few processors, dairy processors remain that uh, there's almost no competition for school milk uh, bids, an open, inv an open invitation for price gouging. Solution number four, bind DFA with a consent decree similar to the Agrimark HP Hood consent decree created in the early 1980s. In the early 1980s, the lar then largest dairy farmer cooperative in New England, Agrimark, sought to purchase HP Hood, the region's largest fluid milk processor. Com competing, there were com competitors back then, competing fluid milk processors complaints inspired the United States Department of Justice to forge a consent decree requiring that Agrimark offer the sale of farm milk to all competitors of HP Hood on the same terms as HP Hood was acquiring milk from Agrimark, no in-house special price cutting deals. Uh, I would argue that a similar consent decree would be in order to, uh, currently and uh, require DFA to offer milk terms as it sells milk to its own milk processing subsidiaries. Number five, conduct a forensic audit of DFA and its many dozens of subsidiaries and joint ventures. DFA's financial condition and performance raise many questions. Is the cooperative engaging in profiting its non-member subsidiaries and joint ventures at the expense of dairy farmers' milk checks? Federal laws and DFA's own foundational documents require that the cooperative operate for the benefit of its members. Lots of questions there. Next solution, break up DFA into its operating regions and force sell-off of key milk producing, milk processing plants in the Northeast. Call this the quote, Ma Bell solution, unquote, similar to the Justice Department's breakup of the Bell system, Bell telephone system in the early 80s. And I would urge that the nation's largest milk cooperative uh, be broken into its seven operating regions by federal, by federal intervention and allow no common directorships, no common ownership of joint ventures, no common management uh, overlap, no common uh, financial uh, indebtedness. Sever, you know, break, break apart the, uh, the regional operating units and make them stand on their own feet. Further, selling off critical assets in the Northeast is necessary to break down this 85% mark, estimated 85% market share. I would recommend that the Florence, New Jersey uh, plant, a little south of Trenton, and the Guida uh, Dairy here in New Britain, Connecticut, be, be offered for sale. This, this next suggestion gets technical and I'll, I'll hustle through it. The federal, the prevailing regional federal milk order, a branch of USDA, requires all handlers or firms buying milk directly from farmers to commit 10% of their milk supplies each month to the fluid milk market, to fluid milk processors. However, with one firm controlling 85% of the market for fluid milk in the Northeast, other firms simply, some other firms simply can't get access to the fluid market without kowtowing to DFA. And uh, I think the uh, so-called class one performance rules for the Northeast order should be suspended due to a lack of competition. Finally, it's been a hundred years since the Capper Volstead, the federal Capper Volstead Act was passed in 1922. That federal law created at a time when the depression had already started, the Great Depression had already started on many American farms. That law gave agricultural cooperatives, farmer cooperatives, certain exemptions from the federal Sherman and Clayton antitrust acts. Uh, but one hundred, you know, back then milk was delivered by buggy or uh, rudimentary truck to rail, rail stations and, and plants. 
today's dairy, modern dairy industry where milk can travel hundreds of miles, either in raw or packaged form. Today's dairy industry is entirely different uh, than conditions that existed 100 years ago when the Capper Volstead Act was created. And I think that the Capper Volstead Act should be amended to uh, limit agricultural cooperatives antitrust exemptions to the assembly, transportation, and marketing of the raw product, and in all other endeavors such as milk processing, let, let the cooperatives, cooperative-owned businesses, compete on a level playing field with all other businesses. So what I would what I would simply conclude is a couple quoting from a couple sentences from Dr. Ron Cotterell's testimony to the United States Senate Judiciary Committee in October of 2003, 18 plus years ago, doctor, or 18 or 19 years ago, Dr. Cotterell had it all back then, an incredible analysis from the control of farm milk percent in the Northeast to the retail margins in the supermarket. And he concluded, antitrust enforcement has been inadequate. Consequently, private economic power has replaced competitive market forces in the pricing process. Farmers' prices are lower and consumer prices are higher than they would be in a competitive market uh, channel. Dr. Cotterell had it all uh, long ago. Unfortunately, uh, the powers that be were not listening. So hopefully, with all the current concern about the adequacy of our nation's food system and concentration in food processing, hopefully uh, folks are listening now. Thank you.